My name is Walt Kester and I'll be presenting this section on liquid and gas sensing. The agenda is going to be basically to discuss two circuit notes, one involving gas detection and the second involving spectroscopy applications using transimpedance amplifiers for photodiodes. Now, in these applications, we're going to be looking at several design problems. Low current measurement is involved, the effects of noise on our resolution, maintaining the required bandwidth. So we've selected these applications really to illustrate some important design principles applicable to a wide variety of high impedance sensing condition and circuits. And we're going to illustrate these with what we call reference designs or circuits from the lab. Now, a circuit from a lab is a reference circuit that's engineered and tested for quick and easy system integration. The circuit from the lab consists of hardware evaluation boards, which can be purchased, a complete write-up in a circuit note, which is online, complete software which allows you to interface the hardware to a PC in order to actually perform evaluations. In addition, we have complete layout and design files available, PC board layouts, bill of materials, Gerber files, assembly drawings, and drivers, all available for this particular piece of hardware. Now the interface between the circuit from the lab board and the PC can be either a simple serial USB interface using the uh, SDPS board or a more complicated interface using <coughs> a fully uh, black fin based interface board. Either board, depending upon which circuit you selected, will allow you to interface to the PC and get the data in and out of the evaluation board. So let's look at gas detectors. These are very popular in industrial <coughs> environments primarily now for safety because workers uh, typically will wear these on their clothes so that they detect the presence of poisonous gas. And there are a wide variety of these types of gas detectors, but the ones we're going to look at are work on an electrochemical principle. And these can be used to detect a number of different gases, carbon monoxide, chlorine, hydrogen sulfide. All of these gases <coughs> basically can be detected with this type of sensor. The basic sensor is shown here in the circuit and the conditioning circuitry involved is fairly straightforward. The sensor has three electrodes. One is a reference electrode, a working electrode, and a counter electrode. For the electrochemical action to work properly, the working electrode and the reference electrode must be at the same voltage. So we're going to make that happen using a simple feedback loop where we take the output, feed it back into the input, and this forces the control electrode <coughs> to go to the proper voltage, which makes the summing junction of the amplifier zero. So that forces the reference and the working electrode <coughs> to zero volts. The small current that comes out of the working electrode is proportional to the level of the toxic gas. And this is done with an electrochemical reaction. So the current is actually generated in the device itself. So that gets converted into a voltage using a transimpedance amp as a current to voltage converter. So typically full scale output currents for these types of sensors or about 200 microamps full scale. Now this shows the board for the circuit note 234 
this is where the sensor goes and these these devices typically have a standard footprint and this is the adapter which allows the circuit board to interface with the SDP board so that it can be uh, interface to the PC for the software evaluation. This is the basic schematic of the reference design for the gas sensor. Here in the center we see the sensor itself. This is the transimpedance amplifier, the ADA4505 dual. Uh, that converts the current into a voltage. The uh, FET is in here in order to prevent problems on startup damaging the uh, sensor. And this is the input buffer and this is the feedback path which forces the counter electrode <coughs> to the correct voltage so that the voltage across the working electrode and the reference electrode is zero. Now the circuit operates <coughs> on a single 5 volt supply. So we use a reference, the ADR291, to generate a 2.5 volt pseudo ground for the circuit. We also have a buck boost regulator which allows <coughs> an input voltage anywhere from 2.5 to 5.5 volts to generate the 5 volts that drives the circuit. So this simple regulator is highly efficient and also allows a wide variation in the battery voltage for portable type applications. So the total current consumption of the entire circuit is essentially about 110 microamps. This does not include the A to D because the response time of the sensor is quite long. It's measured in seconds. So the A to D converter is operating so infrequently that the it can be in the power down mode most of the time and therefore there's no uh, essentially only minimal current drawn typically a microamp and we picked a 16-bit Sigma Delta A to D which which provides a differential input uh, just because even though the accuracy required by the circuit is only like 12 bits this allows us to <coughs> have plenty of input range and we don't have to worry about saturating the input of the converter with, with the signal levels. This shows you basically what the response time is and this <clears throat> this is when the sensor is first exposed to the uh, toxic gas, in this case it's carbon monoxide. And this is in seconds, this is like 500 seconds so <clears throat> you can see uh, that the response time is pretty slow. So the accuracy of 1 to 5% is really about all that's required in these applications. So the basic CN234 uh, reference design provides a nice platform <coughs> for experimentation with these electrochemical sensors. The 16-bit A to D allows easy evaluation of the circuit because we don't have to worry about uh, dynamic range since we're only looking for 12-bit accuracy. This provides plenty of headroom. And there's a 10-bit header on the board that allows <coughs> simple access to the ADC serial port provided you, you, if you don't want to use your SDP board uh, you can interface it to your own microcontroller. And this just shows the basic package, the hardware, the adapter board, the software display that you would get, <coughs> and what's available in the design files. Okay, let's move to the next topic, which is spectroscopy and colorimetry. And in this section, we're going to cover some fundamentals of spectroscopy, talk about some of the signal conditioning required, synchronous detection, and some fundamentals of photodiodes, and also some fairly detailed discussions on the photodiode preamp design. Because in this 
type of analog circuit, you're dealing with very low currents, so bias current is a problem, uh, stability issues with the amplifier due to the <coughs> input capacitance, the trade-off that you have to make between noise and bandwidth, how to get programmable gain, which is often needed in these types of circuits, and the circuit note 312, the <coughs> dual channel spectroscopy demo, illustrates a nice system solution for this and it illustrates some, some good uh, principles. So basically spectroscopy is the study of the interaction between matter and radiated energy. So matter is equal to liquids and gases and when they're heated they generate some sort of light and if you try to pass light through a liquid or a gas <coughs> it's going to absorb certain certain colors and pass other colors. So this whole field um, of actually looking at the uh, spectrum of a particular gas or liquid will tell you two things. It'll tell you what the actual liquid or gas is <clears throat> by looking at where the various spectral lines occur. And if you look at the amount of light that's actually passed through the gas or a liquid, it'll tell you how much or how dense uh, the gas or the liquid is. So molecules and atoms have unique spectrum. This shows the absorption spectrum of hydrogen. And if you, if you passed a broad, broad uh, bandwidth of light through hydrogen and you analyzed it, you would notice these distinct lines that occur at specific spots in the, in the uh, light spectrum. And this is different for every different type of atom. Or element. So by looking at where these spectral lines occur, that can tell you exactly what that particular uh, gas or liquid is. The other thing that you can learn is how much, uh, how dense or how much liquid or gas is present by looking at the amount of light going in and comparing it to the amount of light coming out. In this case, we put the liquid in a, in a little container here. And the Beer-Lambert uh, law um, measures this concentration. The, the uh, concentration is given by this, this equation for absorbance. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail on that. The point is, if you know, how, if you know the color of the, of the uh, light going into the liquid and you measure the uh, color of the light coming out as well as the intensity, you can determine pretty much what the... Uh, color of the liquid is. So the problem with that approach is the container itself can introduce color uh, distortions into the light. So what we'll do, we'll pass this light through two containers. One would be a sample container which may hold a known substance such as water or air or whatever solvent we happen to use to prepare the sample. So instead of looking at the difference between the input and the output, we'll just look at the ratio of the light coming out of the sample cell and compare it to the light coming out of the reference cell. So this is used in a lot of applications, <clears throat> medical, uh, water quality, flame detection, gas and liquid chromatography, spectroscopy, all of the frequency bands of interest, uh, particle analysis, NDRR systems, uh, and also colorimetry. But the fundamental uh, principles of the electronics uh, involved is uh, pretty much universal. So this is a typical signal chain for this type of uh, circuitry. We start out with the broadband light source and in a lot of cases we'll use that <coughs> rotating mirror to chop chop the uh, light, pass it through our uh, sample, 
pulse. And we have a series of pulses coming out which we detect with a photodiode receiver. We convert that small amount of current from the photodiode receiver into a voltage. Then we AC couple the signal and we pass it through what we call a synchronous detector or full wave rectifier in order to actually be able to measure the peak-to-peak -peak value of that uh, pulse train. And by doing the chopping action, that removes the sensitivity to fluorescent light, uh, <clears throat> background noise. It, it just makes it really nice in terms of signal processing. So because we have switching going on here, we've got some glitches and we need to go through a good low-pass filter to, to get rid of the glitches. But the final output is basically a DC level which can be processed by a Sigma Delta A to D converter. So we have the programmable gain amplifier to do the current to voltage conversion, the AC coupling, and the synchronous detection. So the bandwidths tend to be pretty low. Uh, the gain of this front end amplifier may be pretty high. And uh, we, whenever we have high gain, we have to worry about stability and we have to worry about the effects of noise. This is just a little more detailed about synchronous detection. In the frequency domain, uh, we have the modulating frequency, which basically shifts the uh, spectrum of interest down to DC. Uh, the easiest way to think of it is just a full wave rectifier that, uh, that I mentioned before. Now the key to the whole circuit is this photodiode receiver. So a photodiode can typically be modeled as a light dependent current source. So the amount of light striking the diode generates a very small amount of current. The parallel uh, resistance of this photodiode is typically in the order of a 500 megohms to 5 gigohms. It's very high. And there's also a fairly large junction capacitance associated with the diode, especially the uh, larger, highly sensitive diodes. And there's a small series resistance in here, which is usually uh, just a few ohms and can be neglected. Now, ideally, uh, with no uh, light falling on the diode, <clears throat> the voltage uh, across the diode should be zero. But in some cases, a small amount of current uh, will flow, and that is called dark current. In cases where the diode is reverse biased, <clears throat> the dark current will be larger, and in many high-speed applications, you would apply reverse bias voltage to the diode in order to uh, minimize this junction capacitance. But for the applications we're going to look at, the diode is basically operating at zero volts bias. So if you operate the diode at uh, zero bias voltage, the amount of current uh, coming out of the diode is very linear with respect to the light intensity. And as long as this dark current is less, <coughs> is less dark, the voltage is less than 10 millivolts or so, uh, this, this follows a very uh, predictable characteristic. So if you look at the uh, simple circuit to do the current to voltage conversion, it, on the surface it looks pretty simple. It's just an op amp with a fairly large feedback resistor which takes the diode current, converts it into a voltage using the simple, simple equation. So we talk about the gain of the circuit which would be typically expressed in dB which would be 20 log of the feedback resistance divided by a reference resistance of one ohm. So if we wanted to talk about the gain of the circuit, that's, that's what we would mean. So if you connect the diode to the inverting input, uh, the current will flow through the feedback resistor and generate <coughs> the output voltage. 
but we're talking about very low currents down in the microamp. So we are going to have to have an op amp that has very low bias current because the bias current will add to the diode current and produce an error in the output voltage. And also the offset voltage of the op amp can cause a certain amount of dark current to flow. So we got two things going. We've got to have a high impedance input and we've got to have a fairly low offset voltage. So 90% of these applications are going to be using fed input type op amps. Typically with bias currents down in the picoamp range and offset voltage hopefully less than a millivolt or two. So this is an example of some of the fed amplifiers that would probably work in these circuits. There's another issue equally as important as the bias current and that has to do with the basic stability of the circuit because for this particular diode that we selected the shunt capacitance is 150 picofarads the shunt resistance is 600 mega ohms so the amplifier that we picked the AD8615 has an input capacitance of 9.2 picofarads and a 24 megahertz unity gain bandwidth and we're going to assume that the feedback resistor RF is equal to 1 mega ohm so that we get 5 volts on the output when the diode current is 5 microamps. The problem with, with the circuit is the capacitance of the diode plus the input capacitance of the op amp add together and form a pole in the open loop transfer function. So this circuit is basically going to be an oscillator if we don't do something uh, to compensate for this pole. So the po other point here is that when you look at specifications on these op amps, usually you will see a specification for the differential input capacitance and the common mode input capacitance. So the actual input capacitance that you would use to model the circuit would be the sum of the differential capacitance and the common mode capacitance, which in the case of the 8615 is about 9.2 picofarads. So here's the transfer function of that basic circuit. This is the basic open loop pole uh, <coughs> due to the, the due to the uh, roll off of the basic amplifier and then we have a second pole here due to the shunt capacitance, the input capacitance and the feedback resistance. So we have two poles. This is going to cross unity gain at 12 dB per octave so <coughs> we essentially have no no phase margin and we have an oscillator. So in order to make this circuit stable we need to get the phase margin up to at least 45 degrees, <coughs> preferably 60, in order to make it really uh, sure that you're not going to have trouble. So to do that we have to add a feedback resistor across the a feedback capacitor across the feedback resistor. And we have an approximate formula here so that in order to get at least 45 degrees phase margin <clears throat> the feedback capacitor should be greater than this particular formula which is a function of the total input capacitance, the feedback resistance, and the op amp unity gain bandwidth product. Now you can use a larger capacitor than this. If we go through the numbers for this particular circuit using the values that we mentioned, uh, this value is going to turn out to be about one picofarad. And that's not really practical. You get parasitic capacitance is equal to that just due to PC board traces. So for now we'll select the feedback capacitor to be about 4.7 picofarads so that we're sure we're up in the range of reasonable uh, capacitance values. So this shows the open loop uh, frequency response with the capacitor added. This is the open loop gain and this is the uh, open loop 
phase this is the phase margin and we see that the phase margin uh, when we go through zero uh, zero gain zero db gain is about 85 degrees which is which is which is a reasonable uh, amount of phase margin now the fact that the phase margin goes below 45 degrees back in this region uh, doesn't really matter because during, at this point we have enough open loop gain so that uh, this is far enough away <coughs> that we're far enough away from the zero crossing so that these these this doesn't really bother you this is called conditional stability now looking at the actual signal gain and this is the closed loop gain with respect to the input current this is very low this is just equal to 1 over 2 pi times the feedback resistance times the feedback capacitance and it's only 34 4 kilohertz so now that we've looked at the uh, stability issue let's take a look at the noise issue so these types of amplifiers basically in this circuit have several noise sources we have the standard resistor Johnson noise just due to the large resistor value we have input current noise which is modeled as a noise source on the, on the uh, input as a current and we have the input voltage noise which is modeled as a voltage source in series with the non-inverting input so all of these add up to give you the total output noise so first of all let's look at the noise just due to the feedback resistor so this voltage noise here is given by the standard uh, equation for resistor noise and this noise is integrated over a certain bandwidth which is determined by the R and the C so we have 1 mega ohm 4.7 picofarads that gives us a certain bandwidth so the noise voltage is going to be integrated over that bandwidth and in this case if we do the simple uh, integration it works out to be about 30 microvolts RMS reflected to the output now the current noise on the inverting input of the amplifier flows through the feedback resistor so this is going to give us a small voltage noise and that <coughs> noise is going to get integrated over the bandwidth determined by CF and RF so if we have an input current noise of, five, of 50 femtoamps per root hertz that gets multiplied times the 1 mega ohm feedback resistor times the square root of the bandwidth determined by the R and the C and that works out to be about 12 microvolts RMS now in reality the feedback network and the feed forward network are complex impedances so the output noise voltage due to the voltage noise has to be integrated over the noise gain of the circuit which is a frequency dependent value so it's not as simple as doing the uh, uh, current noise and the resistor noise so the noise gain is completely different from signal gain remember signal gain is the, signal gain and uh, is the is the amount of gain applied to the small current which flows through the feedback resistor and that bandwidth is determined by the RF and CF but the voltage noise <coughs> uh, is integrated over the noise gain which is the uh, gain seen by a small signal into the uh, inverting and into the non-inverting input so what happens is the noise gain is going to start out at 0 dB and then it's going to peak and then it's going to flatten out due to the feedback capacitance and then it's going to start going down again where it intersects the open loop gain so these are the equations that define these breakpoints 
So this is the curve that you, over which you have to integrate the input voltage noise. So that can be fairly uh, difficult to actually do the integration, but what you can do is realize that you're working in, in uh, octaves here, so the primary contribution is going to be due to the part that occurs at the higher frequencies, so you can almost neglect what happens down here and just look at the <coughs> contribution over the last two, two uh, decades. And if you do a simple model, a simple approximation to the uh, <coughs> noise density after it goes through the noise gain, you can, you can do the calculation and you can get very close. In this case, we calculated it to be 254 microvolts. If you actually go through the integration uh, you can you you don't really get much different. It's 266, so certainly the approximation is good enough. Just as an aside here, uh, I mentioned that 90% of these applications are going to require fed input op amps, just because you need the low bias current. But let's look at what happens for a fed input amp. I mean, typically, <clears throat> the input voltage noise of a fed input amp is going to be greater than that of a bipolar op amp. This is almost always true. But the input uh, current noise is going to be much less because <clears throat> the input current is low to start with. If you look at the voltage uh, in the, the bipolar type input op amp, you can get down in the 1 to 2 to 3 nanovolt per root hertz range in terms of the voltage noise, but of course the input current noise is much higher. So unless you're really operating at very high temperatures, in that case with the fed input, since it doubles every 10 degrees, you can get some fairly high bias currents, but usually you're operating down in the region below 85 degrees C. So in that case, 90% uh, of these applications are going to be filled with uh, some type of fed input or CMOS input op amp. So we took that basic circuit and we calculated the output noise due to the resistor, due to the current noise, and due to the voltage noise. And the biggest contributor, interestingly enough, is due to the input voltage noise of the op amp. And the reason for that is this gets integrated over that very high bandwidth. So on the surface, uh, this looks like uh, uh, that we've got a real problem. But in actuality, uh, if you think about it, the signal bandwidth of the circuit, in other words, from the current, what bandwidth does this small current see? It's only, in this case, 34 kilohertz. So the noise, uh, uh, the bandwidth, the noise gain goes out to uh, uh, several hundred megahertz. So that doesn't make any sense. To, leave, to use all of that bandwidth, we can simply put an RC filter out here that takes, that, takes out all the noise above essentially 30 or 40 kilohertz, and if we do that, we can, we can eliminate the, most of the noise due to the voltage noise. We can knock it down from 256 down to 49 microvolts. Just a simple single pole low pass filter can do that. So this is a general principle here. Uh, the final output of these uh, transimpedance amplifiers, just by the nature of the transfer function that you get when you compensate it, it's going to give you way more bandwidth than you really need as far as the noise bandwidth goes. So a simple RC filter on the output is not going to affect the signal bandwidth, but it will really knock down the RMS noise. So that's a fundamental principle. Now because many of these uh, liquids can be either clear, fairly clear, or fairly dark, uh, there's a good reason why you may need some sort of a programmable gain amplifier in combination with that input transimpedance amplifier in order to keep, 
get the required dynamic range in the system. So this can present a problem. Designing a good uh, programmable gain amplifier that doesn't contribute uh, a lot of noise to the system. So the traditional approach would be to take our <coughs> fundamental transimpedance amplifier and follow it with the programmable gain amplifier, which seems to make sense on the surface, but the problem uh, with the PGA is that if we uh, amplify the signal here by a factor of 10, we also amplify the noise by a factor of 10. So uh, that's not that's not really a good uh, a good thing in most in most most cases. So this shows that approach. We're trying to get the gain here with the PGA, and by doing the PGA approach, we're essentially going to increase the signal by the same amount as we increase <coughs> the noise. The other way to get more gain is to go up on the value of the feedback resistor. If we do that, in order to keep the amplifier stable, we're going to have to change the feedback capacitor because the optimum value for stability depends upon the value of the resistor as well as the other uh, things that we talked about. But this approach will always give you better noise performance because uh, if, you, if you multiply this resistor value by 10, the, the gain of the circuit goes up by 10. But remember the formula for uh, resistor noise is proportional to the square root of the resistor. So the noise only goes up by the square root of 10. So we have a significant improvement in the noise performance using this approach versus this approach. So this shows the uh, uh, basic circuit. Uh, again, you can put the low-pass filter on the output <coughs> to attenuate the higher frequency noise. Uh, in this case, for a gain, for a 1 megaohm feedback resistor, if we go to 10 megaohms, <coughs> the, uh, to keep, we can keep the same bandwidth by changing the feedback resist capacitor, but the noise only goes up by 3x instead of 10x. And the other thing is you don't have to worry about the errors created by adding another amplifier. So how do you do that? Well, the one approach is just to put uh, CMOS switches in series with the two feedback networks. And this, is, this gives us two possible gain configurations. And remember that uh, for each gain configuration, we're going to have to have a different value of compensation capacitor. Got a bigger feedback resistor, the capacitor is going to have to be smaller. So we'll need to switch that in and out, the two paths in and out with CMOS switches. And in this approach, the switch resistance is in series uh, with the feedback resistance, so conceivably that could introduce an error. It may or may not be a problem because we can get CMOS switches with on resistances less than 1 ohm. So if this is a mega ohm, then that's not really significant. But in some cases, it could be. So an, a way to get around that is to use this uh, approach called Kelvin switching, where we add a couple of extra switches so that uh, when the switch uh, is uh, connected like this, I've got <coughs> the CF2 and RF2 network uh, connected and the other one is turned off. I have on resistance here in series with the op amp output, but this particular resistance is inside the feedback loop, so it's not really a source of error. The resistance on the output in series essentially with the output uh, would produce an error if you loaded this heavily, but in most cases we're going to go into another high impedance amp here, so that's not going to really present a problem. So this Kelvin switching idea works really well to <coughs> change the, uh, the gain. It's good compromise if you want to eliminate the errors due to the 
uh, switch resistance. Typically, the parasitic capacitance of the switch that's turned off, which is the one you have to worry about, is less than a picofarad or so, but that does affect the uh, stability because note that this particular this capacitance uh, interacts with the capacitance of the CF1 and that can affect the overall stability of the amp. This shows where the equivalent uh, capacitance actually shows up in the circuit. For the off side we got that stray capacitance connecting between the off resistance and the on and the and this part of the resistance path that's turned on. So it can produce a small error, but generally speaking, uh, it it can be minimized and it it, it can be uh, it can almost be neglected. Now there are other ways you can work. You can add extra switches in here in order to reduce this effect even further, because when you put capacitors in series of equal value, the total capacitance will go down and that's the principle behind some of the other circuits that are shown in the actual uh, slides. We typically found uh, that uh, this particular configuration uh, using, the, using the Kelvin switches, this shows the extra switches you might want to add in order to reduce it further. Uh, we found that in the circuit, this particular combination of just uh, using the four switches, the two, the two switches uh, in the Kelvin configuration, operated with uh, good with good success and minimum minimum amount of problems. And these are the actual values that were used in the uh, reference design 312. So this shows the board for the dual channel colorimeter. We, we have essentially red, green, and blue LED drivers. Uh, the light gets split between the reference container and the unknown container, and we have photodiode receivers on the other side, and we process the two channels. So the uh, circuit contains the synchronous detection, the LED drivers, the photodiode receivers, and the pro some programmable gain uh, ability in the uh, input stage. This is a <coughs> simple diagram of the circuit, and instead of using a rotating wheel, we use actual uh, LEDs with a clock that runs at about 5 kilohertz. So we, we, we pulse the <coughs> beam splitter with red, green, and blue LED light, pass it through the reference and the sample, do the current to voltage conversion, AC couple, buffer, and then go into the synchronous detection and into a sigma delta converter into a multiplex front end actually uh, to, to digitize the signal coming from both uh, the, the reference channel and the unknown channel. So this is a neat little platform for uh, playing around with programmable gain transimpedance amplifiers, photodiode receivers. Uh, the hardware we use is a 16-bit Sigma Delta A to D which allows you to take the received output, digitize it, and put it into a PC. And we've done some analysis for different different color liquids, and you can really detect uh, very very subtle differences in color. Color so close that you can't really tell the difference with the naked eye, but the uh, the RGB uh, received uh, output by analyzing the amplitude of that, you can you can tell the difference. So it's a neat uh, it's a neat demo, and you can see that in the uh, virtual exhibition hall. So just to summarize, <clears throat> many many of these chemical analysis applications are based on light and photodiodes. 
So the photodiode uh, design is a really challenging analog problem because we've seen that the shunt capacitance uh, immediately causes instability in the current to voltage converter has to be compensated. Compensation reduces the signal bandwidth. Uh, if you're trying to get significant bandwidth out of these circuits, then that's a completely different uh, set of trade-offs to make. Uh, the problem of noise uh, that occurs, uh, you, you have to do the filtering on the output in order to get rid of the uh, noise due to the noise gain. Uh, the, it's just a very challenging analog design problem and it's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and if you look at our portfolio, uh, we, we certainly have enough FET input or CMOS type input op amps to uh, provide solutions. However, depending upon the bandwidth requirement and the sensitivity, uh, the capacitance of the diode, uh, the, there are a lot of different amplifiers that you can select from and selecting the right one for the particular application can be a challenge if you don't understand these fundamental principles that we've covered. So I'd encourage you to look at the demo in the uh, exhibition room for the gas uh, detector circuit and also for the spectroscopy colorimetry circuit. This is the hardware. Uh, we mentioned this earlier. Com hardware, design files, schematics, uh, software is all available <coughs> for both the uh, gas detector and the colorimetry spec demo. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, and encourage you to look at some of the reference material and also to visit the exhibition area. Thanks a lot.